Welcome to the RJI Futures Lab, where we help you make your organization more innovative. I'm Ruben Stern. This week, putting together public data on elected officials and the growing role of the viral news editor. Several large news organizations have recently added to their staffs the job of viral news editor. We spoke with a few of these editors to learn more about the job itself and the content they oversee. A viral news editor basically scours all of the news and all of the internet and everything that's going on and uh, writes up various stories for their entertainment or news site, or in my case for news sites what a viral content editor does is pick out only the very best and most important and most interesting thing that you need to read that day so that you don't have to do that because it would be impossible for a regular person in a regular job with a regular life to be able to look through everything that there is on the internet. There is a certain algorithm in place. I mean, there are things that you know that do well, but at the same time, you know, there's, it's always a little bit of an educated gamble. The thing about it is that's that's really interesting is that there's a lot of human psychology that goes into kind of viral content because you're really always trying to determine what is it that people and mass find super compelling and super interesting. Um, so it's very, very important. A big part of being a viral content editor is every single time a story does really well or does or just as importantly does very, very poorly to sit down and really dissect why exactly did this do well and why didn't it do well. And obviously social media in that aspect is a really big help because you can look at comments and you know there's a lot of things that go into it. But it's difficult because I write about four or five stories, I would say, a day on average. Um, but I look through hundreds. I look through hundreds of stories, hundreds of videos, um, and you know, you really need to be able to evaluate them and to make a decision very, very quickly. With cat and baby videos, it's not like any cat or baby video is going to go viral. I mean, there's so, like, people don't realize just how many thousands of those are uploaded onto YouTube on any given day, and there's like really only one or two, maybe in a week, that will really like captivate people. They have to have that extra, you know, nugget, and uh, that's the extra nugget that, you know, is our job to find. The worst thing that can happen to your content is someone feels nothing. Like indifference is the worst. There are people who would rather be hated because you have more potential to go viral or have content that's trolled because at least it will get shares. But that indifference is what really kills any potential for virality. And part of that is the problem it becomes, especially for companies, is they start trying too hard. And the internet hates when you try too hard. We have so much success for virality in organic content. That video that a dad shot of their baby singing in the back seat, because they're not trying to go viral. They just happen to capture this human moment that everyone can relate to. Now it's all about the visual. So we're seeing this, you know, video is so huge now. So we're seeing more news organizations create viral videos. Like Kevin Bacon explains the 80s to millennials. He liked it, came in, shot it in 30 minutes and was out. But it was understanding like, these are three things the internet likes. Kevin Bacon, 80s, and millennials. Put them into one video, make sure it's still smart, and get it out there as quickly as you can. Keeping tabs on every local politician is important journalism, but in reality, it's difficult to actually do. So what if technology could help? The newsroom at NPR affiliate station KBIA recently partnered with colleagues from the University of Missouri to create just such a system, a website called Access Missouri. The problem that needs to be solved is that there's not a good way for you to track what happens at the state legislature. So things like voting records of legislators um, were hidden away on PDF documents um, and weren't very usable in a data format or for any sort of really like cumulative research. Um, you couldn't go out and find my legislator's voting record simply. Uh, it just wasn't possible, or if you're going to do it, it's going to take hours and hours of manual research. Now on Access Missouri, users can learn more about their legislators' activity, including votes, committees they serve on, and bills they've sponsored. The site also displays legislators' financial records and a timeline that tracks contributions and spending. Connecting the dots is a big deal, says Famuliner. If somebody votes one way on a bill, then gets a million dollar donation from an influential donor and then votes differently on the bill the next time it comes up, um, that's a really monumental 
piece of information, connection that needs to be made. That's an extreme example, um, but it kind of gives you a flow of how all that information happens. So one of the keys for us in the way we visualize this data were, were timelines. We thought that the, the timeline aspect, the, the idea of how things happen, you can track how things, the process of how things happen at the state legislature, we thought was key to provide understanding and the opportunity for discovery, whether that's by a regular person out there, regular Missouri voter, or a researcher or a journalist. Access Missouri pulls data from the state legislator, the Missouri Ethics Commission, and gets some information from open states, a similar project that collects legislative data from all 50 states. The voting record data is probably the most difficult um, task for us in Missouri because we had to go through and scrape all of that information off of a PDF document, partnering with the MU Informatics Institute, who knew how to do all that kind of stuff. Because journalists, most of the people I work with, don't know how to do that technical aspect of things. So scraping all that information off of those PDFs and then inputting it into data, well, that was a big task for our informatics team to, to figure out. And they worked with journalists to figure out how to do that most effectively. Like our journalists had to tell them what each vote meant and how it should be stored. To do any project like this, you first need to have somebody who understands what data is important and what data is available. How all that data is kept is very important. Um, so part of this project is just compiling all the data that you need. Um, there's data all around us available in different formats, and people that understand how to connect that on the front end um, and push something out that's valuable to your audience on the back end, I think we'll be able to establish uh, very strong audiences in the digital space. To develop this project, KBIA partnered with the Missouri Informatics Institute and the Truman School of Public Affairs at the University of Missouri. For the Futures Lab, this is Tatiana Daria. Along with this video, you'll find more information, including a link to the Access Missouri site. And that's it for this report from the RJI Futures Lab. I'm Ruben Stern. We'll see you in the future.